Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to our CPD webinar organized by GMOA and Society for Health Research and Innovation. To avoid the, uh, interaction during the webinar, please kindly uh, mute your microphone, turn off the camera, and also use the chat box to clear your doubts. The link for the certificate for participation uh, will be sent to the chat box at the end of the webinar. Answer the post-assessment questions and apply for the certificate. Uh, is irrespective of your marks, uh, every applicant will be given the e-certificate. The webinar will be available at the Sri uh, YouTube, cha uh, YouTube channel uh, within the couple of days. You can go through the lecture again through that and also subscribe to our, our YouTube, YouTube channel. I would like to uh, acting consultant physician, Dr. Himal Oshada Kalambarachi, to introduce today's speaker. Good morning. Uh, thank you for introduction, Dr. Sachini. Today we are going to discuss a very important topic, which is which we found a division in among our doctors. Uh, it's about snake bite, pathophysiology, and management. We thought of having a two separate session for this topic. First, we are going to discuss today about snake bite, how to identify the snakes, and bit of pathophysiology. Without further ado, I will introduce our resource person today, uh, who is Professor Anjana Silva. He is a professor in medical parasitology at Faculty of Medicine at Rajarata University of Sri Lanka. He is a product of UP University of Pair Avenue and uh, he has uh, graduated at 2012 and he obtained his PhD. Uh, he obtained his MPhil at the same university in 2017. And uh, he uh, went to the University of Monash to do his PhD and obtain his PhD at 2017 and he's senior research fellow in the same university. He has authored several research publications in leading journals on taxonomy, biology of freshwater fish, lizard, venomous snakes, including the discovery of eleven new species. For the last 12 years he investigated the pathophysiology of snake enemy and role of antivenom treatment combined with clinical studies, a classical experimental and molecular pharmacological studies. He published 53 research papers in reputed international journals. He has indexes of 20 with over 950 citations. He is a member of the Snake Expert Committee of Sri Lanka as well as He's, uh, uh, he's involved compiling of SLME snake bite management guidelines. Professor Silva won over 25 international and local awards in recognition of his work. Also delivered uh, three prestige, prestigious orations and delivered several invited talks and keynotes address international and local symposiums. So, uh, I would like to invite Professor Anjana Silva to give his speech regarding the topic. Thank you. Professor Silva, it's audio. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Himal. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, can you all hear me clearly? Yes, sir, we can hear you. You can okay. continue. Okay, uh, a very good morning to all of you. Um, I'll um, start sharing my um, slideshow. I hope you can uh, see the slides now. Yes, sir, we can see. A dynamic board disease, so of course it's asymptomatic most of the time. Okay, so um, 
now um, again very good morning and uh, as uh, dr himal said now in this uh, lecture i'm uh, uh, focusing on uh, you know a bit of introduction with regards to medical importance snakes and how do we can identify them um, practically um, in uh, probably in etu setting and then what kind of problems we encounter in identification and then a little bit of pathophysiology because i guess uh, pathophysiology of uh, snake envenoming is something that often less spoken about so probably it would be better to have some understanding of how uh, snake venoms cause various uh, pathophysiological alterations in humans which might help you in taking a certain clinical decisions so uh, snake bite is a serious public health concern um, across the tropics and um, most of the um, you know burden is recorded from south asia and then southeast asia and then sub-saharan africa and latin america also records large number of snake bites and envelopings now if you look at sri lanka now sri lanka is um, sri lanka records or at least estimated to have uh, very high uh, snake bite incidence rates um, uh, compared with global standards um, so it is estimated that about about uh, nearly like 400 snake bites uh, do occur uh, per 100,000 population per year uh, in Sri Lanka uh, and it is estimated that around like 151 envenomings per 100,000 population per year this is the for the whole Sri Lanka and uh, if you take um, you know the dry zone especially like uh, areas like north central province these numbers are quite high even more than uh, this uh, are, uh, in uh, north central province um the uh, bite rates are about like one and a half times more than the national figures and um envenoming rates are about like almost three times than the national figures so what uh, this means is that within the country uh you know this landscape of snake bites and envenoming envenomings greatly differ so we need to have some understanding of that uh when we uh you know uh, talk about snake bites. So uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, there are about 106 species of snakes, uh, 91 land, uh, land species and about 15 sea snakes. And of that, only 24 land species and 15 sea snakes are considered venomous. Uh, but not all of them are medically important. That is the key point. And uh, of them, only six species have caused, uh, reportedly caused deaths reportedly uh, there may be unreported deaths but we don't know and um, generally people think uh, sea snakes all sea snakes are highly venomous and they cause they can uh, cause deaths that is not true only certain species of uh, sea snakes can cause serious envenomings some snake uh, some sea snakes they can't cause serious envenomings uh, even there are sea snakes without any teeth uh, so they can't basically cause bites so um, that is something for us to remember and also there are many ways of subjective classifying snakes based on venom toxicity. you know people often use classifications like highly venomous moderately venomous mildly venomous and so on which they don't have proper clear definitions so there are problems in using all all sorts of uh, these definitions so basically i use uh, the term medically important snakes in Sri Lanka uh, and then there are like if you look at the number of snake bites uh, and then number of uh, bites that lead into envenomings and the number of envenomings that lead into severe envenomings there are only five important highest important snakes uh, in Sri Lanka that is Russell Swiper, Indian Crete common cobra, so scale viper, and meram sampnos pit viper. And there are another five snakes that can cause serious envenomings, but they are lesser in medical importance because the number of bites are much less or very rare, right? Uh, Ceylon crate uh, is one of those. There are uh, death reports even. However, Ceylon crate bites are much less in number because the geographical range uh, is uh, very narrow and the habitat types are very narrow and uh, therefore the encounters with humans are less likely and then um, you know the lowland uh, hump nose viper who is restricted to the wet, wet zone rainforest and highland hump nose viper 
mainly restricted to the very high elevations and the green pit viper and also big sea snakes they are their number of bites and envenomings are less so basically what i mean by and identifying the medical important snakes is like you know because we are not zoologists uh, the doctors are not supposed to like you know not expected to identify all sorts of non venomous snakes only thing we need to be uh, you know capable of is to identify the most important medical important snakes um or, or medical important snakes from those who are not medically important so this uh, algorithm that i'm going to show you uh, uh later in this presentation it deals with that so first we need to have some understanding of the distribution of the uh, medically important snakes now um this uh you know uh, uh these maps shown in the uh, slide are very recently published ones are uh, based on the uh distribution risk of the individual snakes now the top um uh snakes two snakes are uh, indian crate and uh, ceylon crate now you can see the indian crate is distributed mainly in the dry zone and intermediate zone of sri lanka whereas the ceylon crate is distributed mainly in the wet zone and then some parts of the uh, intermediate zone right and then russell swiper that's in the middle uh, left hand side uh, Russell swiper is probably distributed everywhere apart from very high uh, elevations uh, like in Noorelia and so on. And so scale vipers are mainly distributed in the arid zones, Japna Peninsula, Mena, Puttalam district, and then East Coast, right? Nothing in the, in the, uh, you know, the center of the country or even in the Southwestern wet zone or um, the other, you know, the central highland areas. And then hump nose wipers, I'll be taking them together. So hump nose wipers, they are basically pretty much distributed everywhere because this includes three species. So one species, the commonest one, uh, Hypnale, Hypnale, uh, lives in um, like throughout the country, uh, apart from the very, uh, you know, the highlands as well as the rainforest. So in highlands, uh, it is replaced by highland pit, hump nose pit viper and within the rainforest, it is uh, replaced by the lowland hump nose pit viper and then cobra you can see it's almost again distributed throughout the country but uh, cobras in number are much less compared to like other snakes like hump nose and uh, russell swipers so you need to have this bit of understanding to appreciate uh, um, uh, what kind of distribution pattern snake bites have and uh, there and also that will give some indication of you know what are the commonest um, venomous or medically important snakes uh, that are uh, you know uh, occurring around your workstations right uh, so for example say if someone working in say anuradhapura if a patient patient comes uh, and you suspect a crate crate you don't need to worry about whether it's a ceylon crate because it's definitely a indian crate because ceylon crates do not occur in this area right and similarly, say uh, if you are working in somewhere like Candy or um, maybe around Matale or like that, if a viper bite comes, your problem should be whether it's a Russell swiper or hump nose, not so scale, because so scales are unlikely to come um, uh, happen in that particular area. So likewise, if you have some understanding of the geographical distribution, it would be quite easy for you to, um, you know, uh, think of the possible snakes so now the key that i'm going to introduce probably you may know already this key but what i'm trying is to uh, highlight the important identification features of snakes that may be able uh, or that may enable you to uh, you know uh, rule out any non-venomous snakes and uh, and direct towards uh, medically important snakes right so now this is a very easy one now this this generally applies to all snakes in sri lanka there are exceptions this is not a foolproof one but if you use this uh, key or algorithm you can basically identify most of the um, or, or maybe i would say 99% of 
uh, snakes uh, that that are present to your uh, ETUs, right? So very easy. The first step is you have to look at the tail of the snake. If it is flattened bilaterally like a rudder, it's a sea snake. Rudder is a hubbler, right? So if it is bilaterally flattened like a rudder, it's a sea snake. If the tail is cylindrical with a pointed end, can be most of the other snakes, right? What I mean by the tail shape is this. So the top one is a, a cylindrical tail with a pointed end. If you take a cross section, it is rounded, right? Uh, below one is the rudder shaped sea snake tail, right? If you take a cross section, it is a very elongated slit like thing, right? Bilaterally flattened, right? Which, which actually um, gives force for the snake to swim around, right? So all sea snakes have this unique tail, right? So in this first step, we differentiate sea snakes from all other um, snakes. And then the next step is now, since we have separated out the um, sea snakes, now we are looking at the neck. If they are hood visible, then it's a cobra and no hood visible, any other snake. Now, when I say hood, cobras display hood, right, uh, or penne, when they are alarmed, right? So non-alarmed um, cobra has a collapsed hood, like the other picture that I'm showing in this slide, right? But still, this, this collapsed hood is still visible, right? You can see at the neck of the snake, there's loose skin in the either sides. And also you can see this clear spectacle mark, mark which is collapsed as well, because the nice, you know, uh, nice appearance of this um, spectacle marks become visible only in a hood, expanded hood. In a uh, collapsed hood, uh, it, it still you can see it in the dorsal side, but uh, you know, uh, in a collapsed manner. So in the first step, we separated sea snakes. In the se second step, we separated uh, cobras. Now we have all sorts of vipers, we have crates, and we have non-venomous snakes, right? Now we need to uh, find out a way of separating them out. So now the next step is separating vipers from others, right? The third step is you look at the body and the head shape of the snake. So if the general body shape is short and stumpy, it's vipers. If it is long and slender, any other snakes, crate and other confusing non-venomous snakes, long and slender body, right? If you look at the shape of the head, if, if it is triangular with a distinct neck, vipers. If it is oval shaped, any other uh, uh, snake, right? So what I mean by triangular head is this. So you can see, um, you know, the, the left hand side, uh, it is a hump nose wiper head, it's triangular, a distinct neck. You can see uh, the triangular shape very prominently. On the other hand, you have a crate head, right? Oval, oval shape, very easy, uh, cannot miss. It's very easy uh, to separate. Um, so uh, I would probably show the body shape as well. Now, uh, see here, it's a wiper, Russell's wiper. You can see a short and stumpy body, short and stumpy body. Um, it's common for viperine snakes. They are very short and very bulky, right? But if you say, if you look at a crate or any other, um, you know, uh, most of the colubrid snakes who are non-venomous or mildly venomous, they have long slender bodies. It's very easy to look at the body and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, identify whether it's a viper or not. So snakes with triangular heads, uh, distinct neck, a clearly visible necks, and short stumpy body vipers, oval shaped heads, uh, you know, less demarcated neck, 
and long slender bodies can be crates or any other non-venomous um, snakes right so uh, now we are now focusing our attention on snakes with a cylindrical tail with a pointed end so we have extruded the sea snakes no hood we have extruded cobra and having long slender body we have extruded vipers so this includes crates and all sorts of other confusing non-venomous snakes now our objective is to separate out crates right from um, other snakes so now this is the most important point looking at the vertebral and subcordial scale rows because this itself will uh, will provide you or enable you to distinguish most of the other confusing snakes that present to it you right so if the mid dorsal or vertebral scale row, row is enlarged and hexagonal shaped that is crate and if there are scales under the tail arranged in one row or oh, uniseria that is crate right both crates indian crate and ceylon crate right if uh, the mid dorsal scale row is not enlarged and subcordial scales are arranged as two rows or by serial then you don't need to worry about this name so uh, if uh, now this is these are images of crate indian crate now you can see here uh, clearly the mid dorsal scale row is enlarged compared to the other body scales right very clearly this can be seen and it's hexagonal in shape the, the middle one middle image also you can easily see that you know the mid dorsal scale row is enlarged and hexagonal compared to the other body scales in the other uh, one as well so this is these are the vertebral scale rows this is very very um, characteristic for crate so that if you can if you see a snake with you know crate coloration and you are, you are you are you are you are suspecting that this may be a crate just look at the mid dorsal scale row if it is enlarged and hexagonal like this definitely it's a crate right and then um, so this is a, 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 a non-venomous snake called bridal snake there are plenty of uh, non-venomous snakes who mimic the coloration of crates right they pretend the coloration of crates but they are not non-venomous so they frequently come out this is a, a snake that was presented to like um, Andradapura um, uh, etu very recently about like two weeks back right uh, rainy days these days anyone can think this is a crate but if you uh, look at the mid dorsal scale row they are there are no enlarged hexagonal scales they all are in the same size right very easy to uh, distinguish so remember what i'm talking about a very clear character mid dorsal enlarged hexagonal scales in crates right other snakes no such feature and the second thing is the scales underneath the tail whether they are um, uniserial or biserial so uniserial in the sense the bottom one here is a crate tail right uh, under the tail of crates there's only one row of scales whereas uh, non-venomous snakes often they have two um, scale rows now remember there's a pitfall here now in your algorithm we have already extruded the sea snakes uh, then cobras and also vipers now in those animals you don't need to look at the um, subcordals subcordals are here for us to separate crates from other snakes right so if you look at uh, subcordals of vipers sometimes halfway it is uniserial and then it becomes biserial right so this applies only for uh, separating crates from other snakes right so and this is uh, uh, again a comparison of indian crate and bridal uh, snake uh, indian crate you can see 
uh, you know the the tail the this is where the cloaca starts and then from there the tail right you can see uh, the scales under the tail um, are uniserial in Indian crate whereas uh, in the bridal snakes it is biserial right so com combining these two characters you can identify um, crates without a problem and then uh, it's a matter of uh, separating Indian crate from Ceylon crate, right? So Indian crate, as I said, the distribution is completely different. They all can overlap in certain areas, like for example, around like in Mayangan area, and then probably like in uh, like close to Badulla and so on. There can be overlaps in the uh, and in some parts of Matale and so on. But uh, mostly, their their distributions are wider apart. But still, if you look at the specimen, um, both crates have black or gray uh, color body, right? Dark gray body. And they have, uh, the Indian crate has narrow white bands arranged in pairs and abdomen is entirely white. But uh, in a Ceylon crate, the body coloration is almost same, but single white, white bands, right? They are not narrow, they are white and they are arranged individually. And the, uh, if you look at the belly, you can see the dark or the black color areas as well as white color bands separately in uh, Ceylon crate, whereas in Indian crates, abdomen is entirely white, right? So the, from these features, you can easily separate. Now, this is um, Indian crate. These are photos of all Indian crates. Now you can see in some snake specimens, the white bands are very clear. Some snake specimens, not very clear especially like when the crates become older their white coloration become faded and faded and sometimes there can be large crates without even uh, you know noticeable white color bands they are like gray color large snakes right uh, so still don't worry the enlarged hexagonal scales are there and the subcortals are also there so there won't be any any problems in that right so uh, the other important thing is in some parts, I think there was a question as well. Uh, in some parts of the country, these large old crates with, you know, little uh, or, uh, or probably like uh, very, uh, you know, um, uh, unnoticeable white bands, they are called habarla. So in some, some parts of the country, people call habarla for these large crates, right? Uh, but um, they are still crate, they are Indian crate, right? So the bottom one, uh, bottom uh, crate, uh, which I was, I photographed around like in, uh, I guess, Dambulla, uh, that one, you can see the anterior part doesn't have uh, uh, white bands, but the posterior part has, right? But still, it cannot be mistaken, the, the um, vertebral scale row is enlarged and hexagonal, right? And then, uh, you know, if you look at the combination of characters in uh, Indian crate, oval shaped head, long slender body, and then uh, two pairs of white rings arranged, uh, uh, white rings arranged as pairs along the body, right? And uh, mid dorsal scales are enlarged and hexagonal, and snakes under the tail are undivided. So it's very uh, easy to identify, right? Ceylon crate. Well, Ceylon crate, uh, the base body coloration is the same, like black or dark color and with white uh, bands, but they are individually arranged and thick. And as I said, older ones, uh, like in the top uh, left hand uh, side, uh, older ones tend to lose the white color bands similar to the Indian crate, but still you can see the enlarged hexagonal um scales and if you look at the belly side you can easily see the the un, the belly side is with again you can see the dark color areas as well in the belly or the abdomen uh, but in uh, uh, indian crate the abdomen is entirely white right so these are the different colorations of ceylon crate right and uh, there are many snakes as i said before non-venomous snakes who mimic the coloration of um crates right so these are some of these right common wolf snake and then flowery wolf snake shows a wolf snake 
and then uh, bridal snake right uh, and uh, so the abcd are non venomous ones and then e is a indian mm -hmm. snake, right so still the point is enlarge hexagonal uh, mid dorsal or the vertebral scale row and the uh, you know the uh, uh, subcaudal scales those are the uh, characters that will enable you to identify right especially these uh, non venomous snakes are uh, again quite common um, around human habitats right especially like you know these wolf snakes are always around especially in wet areas especially like you know even like quite um, common around like you know um, say around flower pots and all that in outside the um, houses because of the coldness they come uh, close to that uh, and the moisture so often you encounter these snakes uh, even at your home so is to uh, distinguish right uh, morphologically from the traits if you look at the enlarged hexagonal vertebral scale row and then Ceylon crate uh, again uh, in Ceylon crate as I said um, it's mainly in uh, wet zone so that uh, you know uh, there are certain uh, 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 you know snakes in wet zone for example now all uh, four these uh, four of these snakes can present in certain parts of wet zone uh, so that they can also confuse the identification of um, Ceylon crate, right? But still, uh, the principles are the same. And there's one exception, um, Sri Lankan wolf snake, which is called, which only occurs in wet zone, uh, especially in rainforests and, uh, uh, you know, shaded home gardens. It, it, the coloration entirely um, resembles Ceylon crate. Uh, the, well, you know, the uh, mid dorsal, a uh, vertebral row is absent in uh, Sri Lankan wolf snake, Ceylon crate present, so you can distinguish. But if you look at the subcaudal or the scales underneath the tail in Sri Lankan wolf snake, it is undivided like a Ceylon crate. So that's a confusion, but don't you don't need to worry. If you look at the vertebral scale row or the mid dorsal, it applies for any snake, right? Uh, but anyway, Sri Lankan wolf snake bites are quite common, uh, quite rare, unless someone, you know, walks into a forest and get bitten. So uh, the key point is black, gray or dark brown snake with white bands. If you check the mid dorsal scale row, if enlarged and hexagonal crates, check the subcaudal scales, if uniserial crates, right? So if you know this, if you can do this, I think about 70% of your problems in identifying snakes is sold right be aware of the distribution of the two snakes and depending on where you work you can assume which snake is more likely to be present right now we have separated uh, you know sea snakes cobras and then uh, crates and all other non-venomous snakes now we are left with vipers so our objective is to separate out true vipers that is uh, Russell's viper and so scale viper from pit vipers. So pit vipers are, uh, we have four species, green pit viper and three species of hump nose vipers. So there's a pit, heat sensitive pit uh, in pit vipers uh, in between eye and the nostril, right? This pit can be easily seen. Um, so the yellow color uh, uh, pointer indicates the pit, right? So, uh, Based on this character, you can separate uh, pit vipers from the true vipers. But you know you don't really need to look into this feature because separating out vipers is not a problem. You just you don't need to even use the key. You can easily identify a Russell viper because of the unique coloration. You can easily identify hump nose vipers based on their unique, uh, you know, uh, snout appearance. Ray, they have a raised snout and the color green pit vipers are green and black in color so it's very easy to separate but uh, theoretically you can separate them based on the um, presence of a pit in between eye and nostril so pit vipers have uh, this pit the pit this pit is a small like a dip or a hole like thing uh, which has uh, you know thermosensitive receptors or uh, infrared receptors uh, so that uh, pit vipers are very advanced so they can e easily see a heat image of a warm-blooded animal and they can overlap that with 
you know the whatever the visual images they get and they identify a warm blooded prey species but uh, russell's vipers and so scale vipers who are true vipers they don't have that ability right so if there is a pit present if you have a viper and if it is a pit, pit, pit present then it's a matter of separating hump nose from green pit right so hump nose vipers head shields are enlarged so if you have a viper if you find a viper with head shields you can see this image is uh, the diagram head shields are enlarged compared to the other scales of the head right and there is a raised snout right raised snout the, the snout part is raised right uh, and you can see the pit clearly in between the nostril and the um, eye so it's a um, hump nose wiper right so this is again a raised snout of a hump nose wiper and these are the enlarged head shields of hump nose wiper, right? Very easy, you won't easily miss that. And then green pit wiper, well, the coloration is black and green. Uh, sometimes it, it depends on the geographical regions. Like, for example, in like Central Highlands, uh, Central, uh, like, you know, Matale and Candy around area, the, there can be a lot of green color what with yellow and um, black but intermediate zone like Kur close to Kurunagala and so on there are beautiful ones with this um, you know luminous blue color uh, as well right but uh, you can't miss them because this snake is very beautiful uh, very, um, uh, so uh, coloration itself will uh, you know uh, lead you to the diagnosis um, head shields as I uh, you know, as you can see here in the bottom right hand corner one uh, image, head shields are very smaller, right, uh, compared to the hump nose where uh, the uh, head shields are enlarged, right. So this is how you differentiate uh, hump nose wipers from um, the green um, uh, pit wipe. And then the true wipers, again, uh, it's a matter of separating Russell's wiper from so scale wiper uh, very easy from the coloration russell wiper has a unique uh, you know these three parallel rows of elliptical markings running along the body white color v marking uh, on the head uh, so scale wiper doesn't have you know elliptical rows they have various you know blotchy uh, appearance on the body and uh, there's a bird foot mark in most of the specimens right um, so this is a russell wiper you can see, um, you know, it's very easy to identify three rows of elliptical markings running along the body, right? Uh, and then head margin, you can see the anterior margin, there's a V-shaped white color mark, right? Uh, this is for a Russell swiper. Um, and then uh, sometimes you can confuse this with baby pythons, right? Baby pythons also have slightly triangular head but you can see the body coloration is blotchy they are, they are these are blotches not um, uh, you know uh, oval shaped marks right so it um, can be easily distinguished now, this is a saw scale wiper you can see the triangular head and identifiable uh, neck and you can see the scales are very rough uh, right like because they have a saw tooth um, they have sorted uh, on the uh, scales and you can see there are no um, identifiable um, you know the oval shape marks it's blotchy and uh, we know that you know so scale wiper is restricted to only um, you know uh, uh, arid zones of the country so using this now we have basically separated out all uh, problematic snakes right using this key again you, we look at the um, tail first, then head and neck, uh, sorry, then neck, whether it has a hood or not. And then thirdly, the body shape to separate vipers and the other snakes uh, and crates and other snakes and crate, we look at the mid dorsal and large hexagonal uh, vertebral um, scale row and the subcaudal scale row to distinguish them from the other snakes and vipers then we uh, separate based on having a pit or absence of pit presence of pit we have uh, hump nose and uh, green pit vipers 
based on the head shields and the coloration and the rays now we separated them out and for true wipers based on the coloration um, uh, we separated out Russell's wipe and source skin so that is it. it's very simple and there are some other problematic uh, or uh, in literature called uh, highly venomous problematic snakes for example uh, coral snakes there can be rarely coral snake bites present they are um, uh, considered highly venomous in some texts but um, in Sri Lanka also bites have been recorded there are two species uh, um, you know slender coral snake and blood bellied coral snake but uh, none of these uh, resulted in significant enemies because these snakes are quite small their mouth is quite small can't uh, get a good bite and uh, we don't know even they have uh, you know potent enough venom to cause any significant enemy so you don't need to really worry about these snakes right and there are many uh, you know non-venomous snakes that often present to uh, ETUs now these are snakes um, like you know the Andhradhupra ETU received uh, uh, over the last probably like, since 2012 uh, different species uh, so we got um, quite a number of reports they frequently come but uh, you know with the algorithm that we have or the key we have we can easily distinguish them as medically important and uh, medically not important right so if you have any problems you encounter in identifying snakes, right? You can call me, uh, give me a call and WhatsApp uh, or Viber the snake image. Uh, I can, uh, you know, at any time, it doesn't matter. I can, uh, you know, help you uh, in identifying um, the snake, right? Uh, and then uh, there's another, because I'm, I'm saying this because there were some questions asked uh, uh, by participants and there's a snake identification service as well uh, run by my friend uh, Professor Kalna Madhuage uh, from uh, Peradini uh, Medical Faculty. So uh, they have a system, uh, a website, you need to upload the uh, photograph and information and then, uh, you know, um, they will get back to you, right? Um, you can call me at any time or, uh, and plus Viber the, uh, or WhatsApp the image snake image um, i will uh, give an instant identification right so that is with regard to the identification of snake so do you have any questions at this point uh, sir we will entertain the question at the end sir we'll all right okay, okay. Thank you. So then I will move to pathophysiology of envenoming. So this is uh, because pathophysiology of envenoming, I thought it's important to have some understanding so that some of the clinical questions you get can be easily sorted if you have a good understanding of pathophysiology, right? So uh, basically we know that snake venom, um, venomous snakes have venom glands in their head, which make uh, or the produce venom toxins or the venom and then uh, the produced venom is uh, then uh, transported to the fang. Fang is a specialized um, tooth, right? That is um, uh, canalized or uh, allows some sort of venom passage through the fang to the uh, bite victim, right? So when the snake opens the mouth and bites, there's a compressor muscle that squeezes the gland, which inject or which pressurize the venom. Uh, inside the system and the venom will flow towards the uh, teeth, specialized teeth, which is sharp and like needle like so that it will enable the snake to inject venom, right? But uh, different snake types have dif different types of fangs or teeth, right? So colubrid snakes who are basically mostly non-venomous or mildly venomous snakes, uh, they either don't have fangs or that means specialized fangs uh, to inject venom or they may have uh, fangs which are placed posteriorly in the mouth, not anteriorly here, right? So, uh, for example, cat snakes and uh, green wine snake or hatullas, they, they are colubrids, right? They don't have potent venom to cause uh, problems for humans. Their fang is at the back of the mouth so that they need to open the mouth widely to get a bite, right? Uh, so uh, they have their uh, fangs are not specialized in delivering the venom efficiently. If you look at the cross section here, it's a gutter, gutter like thing. So the venom can always, uh, you know, flow out of the 
uh, gutter so that it cannot ensure uh, you know uh, the successful delivery of venom into the uh, uh, prey species all the time but compared to that elapids elapids means uh, cobras uh, you know crates and so on they have front fangs large front fangs right and it is um, canalized right so they have a canal so basically it ensures that the venom flows uh, efficiently to the bite victim only difference is that the fang is uh, quite uh, you know fixed to the upper jaw so they can't move the fang right when they open the mouth depending on the orientation of the bite victim and the mouth uh, you know whether this, they are a successful bite or not determines but compared to that vipers they have front fangs and the fangs are canalized again but their fangs are movable they can move and during the bite they can actually adjust or position the fangs separately the two fangs separately to maximize the chances to inject uh, venom so in that way they are more advanced and they ensure that uh, you know they are envenoming right so how does this become clinically relevant so then there's this concept of dry bite and envenom bite so not all snake bites are able to successfully uh, you know um, successfully um, deliver venom to a uh, bite victim right if there's no venom uh, entered into the body of the bite victim it's a dry bite right and uh, if there's venom injected and then the clinically uh, there's problems happening then it's an envenoming so this is a these are two patients bitten by a crate uh, but uh, one patient didn't have uh, the one in the you know left hand side didn't the, the crate was huge and there was clear bite marks uh, but the lady didn't have any problem right um, no neurotoxicity at all so uh, no envenoming but on the other the other person well developed severe uh, paralysis so it depends on uh, the how successful the bite was in the snake's point of view and then uh, the amount of venom injected then so right so uh, there are certain terms that people use one is uh, poisoning uh, which is a wrong term so you can't say snake bite poisoning poisoning uh, is like when you get or when you um, when a toxic substance enters through uh, the oral or uh, through skin or inhalation that is a poisonous uh, substance right but if a toxic substance directly enters to the blood right uh, actively injected by the venomous animal or the toxic animal that is a venomous animal right so basically in in simple language to get poisoned you have to eat the poisonous animal but to get envenom the venomous animal eats you so who eats who is the theory right and then um, the other thing is envenoming and envenomation people use these two terms but there's nothing different envenoming is in uk english envenomation is us english right but essentially they mean the same now uh, one important thing that we need to understand about venom is it is not a single bioactive component right it is venoms are complex mixture of large number of bioactive substances so, so sometimes certain snake venoms have about 100 120 bioactive substances they get into animal bodies and then cause various pharmacological alterations some may affect uh, blood clotting some may affect neuromuscular transmission some may simply don't do anything some may simply you know uh, with non specifically will damage cell membranes um, like you know different sorts of pharmacological action and this combination of these toxins they are relative abundance how abundant each of these types of toxins and um, how effectively they are absorbed to the system from the circulation will determine what happens to the patient right so um, what we need to understand is pharmacokinetics of different toxins vary for example soon after a bite from the bite side now we know the bite happens uh, intramuscularly or subcutaneously right from there the venom toxins which are proteins right 
they are absorbed to, into the circulation via lymphatics most of the time, right? And in the circulation, different toxins appear at different rates following the bite, right? Sometimes say, for example, we have seen uh, Russell's fiber bites too, directly intravenously and patient died of a myocardial infarction, right? But they are, the venom toxins, large load of venom toxins directly entered into the intravenous compartment directly. So then the consequences are different. But in usual snake bites, it's usually intramuscular or subcutaneous. So different toxins reach the circulation at different rates, right? And they are eliminated from the system in different rates. So uh, what you see uh, as clinical picture is actually a sum of all these dynamic events, right? And then, um, you know, um, for example, say, um, when once the toxins are absorbed, absorbed into the circulation, those who affect blood coagulation will act on the circulation. But those who cause paralysis, they have to move out of the circulation and reach the neuromuscular junction to cause paralysis, right? So that also will determine the timing of um, development of clinical uh, syndrome, right? How fast the toxins are absorbed from the bite site, they, how fast they reach the circulation and how effectively they reach the target sites, right? So that is why, uh, you know, the envenomine syndromes vary a lot. You get Russell's fiber bite, definite Russell's fiber bite, sometimes without coagulopathy. Sometimes with coagulopathy, mild neurotoxicity. Sometimes severe coagulopathy, AKI, but no neurotoxicity. Likewise, right? And you get hump nose wipers most, most of the time, local effects. Uh, and very rarely, they can cause uh, coagulopathy and very rarely AKI, right? This all depends on the venom load, um, the route, and um, how efficient the toxins were absorbed into the system, right? So the most important systemic effect of snake envenoming is coagulopathy. What we need to understand is bleeding. What we see in uh, patients as bleeding is a summative effect of the ability of the, 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 you know, the coagulopathy. That means the inability of blood to clot plus the vascular damage caused by uh, snake venom because certain snakes like um, Russell's viper and so scale vipers they have separate toxins that damage the vascular um, wall leading to extravasation of blood right at the same time they have toxins that affects coagulation right so by simultaneously acting they can cause spontaneous bleeding what is clinically important is um, the ability of uh, uh, the snake venom toxins to cause um, coagulopathy. Now, what uh, the snake bite coagulopathy is a consumption coagulopathy. Now, if you look at the clotting cascade, snake venom toxins, procoagulant toxins, they act on different sites of clotting ca cascade, specifically activating certain fact factors. For example, Russell's viper, they have potent activators of clotting factor 10 and factor 5. So basically, we know that in the usually in our blood, clotting factors are in inactive state. When a Russell's viper bite happens, factor 5 and factor 10 activators come into blood and they activate the inactivated factor 10 to activated 10 and inactivated factor 5 to activated factor 5. So then this lead to subsequent activ the activation of the sub subsequent steps of the cascade leading to um, you know, widespread activation or turning of fibrinogen to fibrin. However, because this is a slow, slow process, happens distributed throughout the body, right? It will not lead to formation of stable clots. Rather, our fibrinolytic pathway get activated and break down all this fibrin, right? So that the fibrin uh, fibrinogen degradation products like D dimers that their level will go high, go up, right? That is why people sometimes do D-dimers and say, oh, there's DIC in this snake bite. No, there's nothing like that. That is because the snake venom activated the clotting cascade leading to a gradual activation of clotting pathway and then fibrinogen were, uh, you know, increasingly converting into uh, fibrin and then now this fibrin is being degraded, right? 
what happens is with this gradually the clotting potential of the patient drops because now all the clotting factors are consumed fibrinogen is consumed so that the patient doesn't have fibrinogen in the blood or has low levels of fibrinogen that creates a poor clotting, clotting potential in the patient that is how the coagulopathy develops now for example hump nose wipers they don't have factor 5 and 10 activators but they have thrombin like enzymes which actually uh, activates fibrinogen leading to uh, uh, production of fibrinopeptide a or b right so so scale wiper it has a certain complete different uh, type of toxin which activate prothrombin right so likewise what whatever happens finally what results in is depletion of fibrinogen or sometimes there may be patients with zero fibrinogen right entire consumption of uh, fibrinogen um, so that patient has a very low clotting potential right now you can understand by giving antivenom you can't reverse this process because we need to give clotting factors how do we get clotting factors the liver produces it right so antivenom can prevent further activation of clotting factors by neutralizing the toxins but whatever the amount of factors that were already consumed by that time you can't replace the liver has to replace that right or else you have to give FFP, right so that is that is that is how the coagulopathy works so basically if you give antivenom um, enough antivenom after uh, you know, when you when a patient comes coagulopathy develops and um, you detect whole blood clotting time is high and then you did INI, INI is also high you give antivenom and then uh, after six hours you do whole blood clotting time and INI still high well that that is a tricky moment right most of the patients by that time there's no active uh, toxins in the blood right unless patient is actively bleeding you can give further doses there's no point of there, there's no pro, no uh, nothing wrong in repeating antivenom um, maybe one uh, dose more if you think that patient looks ill and uh, you know the uh, patient is developing severe um, uh, envenoming and patient is still bleeding and so on that's okay but just because the coagulopathy persists that means liver takes time it takes about nearly 42 to 70 uh, sorry 48 to 72 hours for liver to completely replace the consumed factors right so this is these are some of the studies uh, that actually suggest this what you can see is by second to third day only the gradually the factors um, try to factors coming into the normal range whereas you see if you look at the venom levels in the blood soon after the antivenom was given there's no venom in the blood that means antivenom has already bound with the venom and neutralizes neutralized the venom in the blood but now the body takes time to replace the um, clotting factors right so it's all about liver and then so the key message is um, coagulopathy is due to a consumption of clotting factors which are activated by venom toxins Antivenom cannot replace a clotting factors, but it's very important by giving antivenom as soon as possible, you neutralize whatever the toxins in the uh, blood so that further activation clotting factors can be stopped, right? So coagulopathy doesn't resolve until the river replaces the consumed clotting factors, right? So um, snake bite doesn't cause DIC, right? It's, a, it's because the weak the clinical appearance of weak the investigations also suggest dic but it's a different pathophysiological entity right and also there's another uh, thing can happen uh, especially in viperine bites thrombotic microangiopathy i think you have seen this more often now in russell swiper bites and some hump nose swiper bites right patients can develop microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia along with acute renal failure right so this is thrombotic microangiopathy so this actually happens in a certain portions of patients who develop coagulopathy right and these patients who are 
usually developing um, very severe envenoming usually like you know most of them uh, would uh, require dialysis and some can die i mean um, there are lots of russell swiper deaths who, uh, because of uh, thrombotic microangiopathy um, develop right so thrombotic microangiopathy develops only in a subset of patients who develop weak when i'm induced consumption coagulopathy right there are no patients who develop only thrombotic microangiopathy right always it's associated with weak or when I'm induced consumption coagulopathy, right? And there's large number of when I'm induced consumption coagulopathy patients who do not develop thrombotic microangiopathy, right? The other uh, thing is neurotoxicity. Snake bite neurotoxicity is a peripheral one. It's not a central one. If you look at these toxins, they are large molecules, right? They, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the uh, uh, central nervous system, it's well protected by blood brain barrier and these toxins large proteins can't cross the blood brain barrier efficiently right and the our motor nerves are again protected right with myelination right the only vulnerable region for animal toxins is the neuromuscular junction so the motor nerve terminal and the neuromuscular junction right that is why throughout the animal kingdom animals target this place spiders even bacteria, corn snails, snakes, um, and uh, you know, puffer fish and so on, they all target this specific place, right? Because then uh, these animals, if they target this place and disrupt the neurotransmission across the neuromuscular junction, then they can paralyze the victim quickly, right? So the snake venom neurotoxicity happens in that way, right? So it's a peripheral one it targets neuromuscular junction so it causes placid paralysis right so there are main two types of uh, snake neurotoxins the clinically important ones uh, especially like uh, crates and so on they have presynaptic neurotoxins that damage the motor nerve terminal structurally right they cause structural they basically make holes in the motor nerve terminal so that uh, the recovery uh, of the motor nerve terminal is on its own right antivenom can't go and do anything there because it's a structural damage so the modern out terminal has to repair itself um, within three to five days or uh, sometimes even it might take longer and that is why when you see crate patients crate bite patients within the first day patient develops severe paralysis and then you ventilate the patient and sometimes you ventilate for maybe like five six days sometimes two weeks and then suddenly patient wakes up that is because modern nerve terminals are damaged you are ventilating and keeping the patient alive let it happen like that body will or the modern nerve terminals will naturally recover You keep, uh, you know, um, um, the, the paralysis is going on, you keep ventilating for days, that is because of the presynaptic um, neurotoxin, right? So, um, in summary, like, um, you know, we need to have some understanding of how uh, different snakes cause these um, um, different pathophysiological processes. So, Russell swipe bite, if you would say Russell swipe bites, local effects are usually mild to moderate. You can get severe coagulopathy, neuromuscular paralysis. Russell swiper is not very severe compared to, um, you know, Indian crate, common cobra, or, um, you know, Ceylon crate, right? Uh, but you get severe AKI because of throm thrombotic microangiopathy, and there can be rhabdomyolysis, there's myotoxins, right? Um, and uh, Indian crate, well, it's mainly neuromuscular paralysis, no coagulopathy, no local effects, and um, Slightly there can be rhabdomyolysis because there are some myotoxins and cobra, severe local effects, severe neuromuscular paralysis, plus there can be cardiac arrest because that is something that open missed because usually cobra bites within um, several minutes patients can go into cardiac arrest when, the, when they present to ETU, they are in a cardiac arrest status so that 
often you think that is the neuromuscular paralysis that occurred and then um, led to cardiac arrest. No, it's probably like vice versa. Um, cardiac arrest quickly happens. And then, um, so that at that stage, we think, okay, patient got developed a paral paralysis and um, that is it. No, probably like cardiac arrest happens quite quickly. This happens not only in our cobra, in other cobras in um, other countries like Thai cobra, this, this can, uh, you know, happen. And then, uh, so in that case, probably like, you know, if there's, if people give CPI and uh, take the patient quickly to ETU, then um, would be okay. And uh, hump nose wipers, local defects can cause severe local defects, sometimes leading to amputations. Coagulopathy is often mild and can cause mild acute kidney injury. So scale wipers, mild local defects, severe coagulopathy uh, sometimes, Paralysis is uh, almost unreported, can lead AKI, right? Ceylon crate, um, neuromuscular paralysis, again, similar to uh, Indian crate, right? So, uh, big C snake, um, which is um, seen uh, around like Puttalam area and east, eastern coast, can cause paralysis as well as AKI and cause rhabdomyolysis as well, right? So, uh, this is a bit of a, um, a summary. And then uh, what we need to understand is paralysis in snake bite is primarily due to structural damage of motor nerve terminals. NTNO cannot reverse the motor nerve terminal damage and should repair uh, on their own, right? So uh, problems of diagnosing envenoming is again a question that people have asked, right? What we have observed is people come uh, to the hospital um, now quite early than you expect. Sometimes after a bite, very quickly patient present to the hospital. But you know that in you know large number of portions, you have to observe the patient until they develop uh, you know clinically detectable environment to give antivenom. This is a problem because we don't have good diagnostic tools, right? Um, but in a study that we did in Anuradhapura, what we found was that you know patient come very early to the hospital, but we had to wait because of the problems in the whole blood protein time test or, um, you know, development of uh, clinical features uh, because lead into, you know, delayed uh, detection of envenoming. That's, that's something that beyond our control because, um, you know, we don't have good tests, right? So most of the um, uh, clinical syndromes of envenoming uh, is diagnosed clinically, right? But I would like to talk a bit about whole blood coating time 20 because people ask this question so often. Whole blood coating time 20 is not a good test, right? If you can do INR, do INR, right? Uh, but you can do whole blood coating time 20, but if it is positive, don't worry, you can give antivenom. But if it is negative, that will not rule out um, envenomy. That is the problem, right? So we did some studies. What we found was that whole blood coating time 20 sensitivity can be as long as 50%, right? In detecting INA uh, coagulopathy of INA over 1.5. Even coagulopathy of INA over 3, it was only 70. That means 3 of 10 patients who have coagulopathy more, with INA more than 3 are missed, right? By whole blood coating time 20. So specificity is fairly okay. If it is positive, that means patient is having coagulopathy. But if it is negative, be very careful, right? And then, um, so whenever possible, you can do INA. One other important thing that often we miss is the non-specific features of systemic envenomy. Our studies clearly show that those people who develop severe systemic envenomy or systemic envenoming later, when they present, if they have abdominal pain, that is a very good predictor, right? Always it had more, it was more sensitive than whole blood coating time 20, right? See now, abdominal pain alone in snake bite patients, um, the uh, uh, sensitivity um, of detection systemic envenoming was 89%, right? Severe systemic envenoming 84%. And if you combine vomiting, abdominal pain, and headache in combination, specificity was around 
and uh, severe systemic envenoming, it's around like 89%, right? Uh, so that is again, uh, don't wait for uh, whole blood protein time negativity. If you have these features, uh, you can actually decide. Even like in current snake bite management guideline, that has been included because of that, right? Abdominal pain is, if abdominal pain is there, and if you are sure it's a crate bite, right? Don't wait until you, the patient develop ophthalmophagia, just give antivenom, right? And if um, if there's a Russell swiper bite and you know it's a Russell swiper, definite Russell swiper bite, you do whole blood coating time and it's negative. But the patient is having abdominal pain and patient complains of a blurred vision and so on. Don't wait. Give antivenom. It's in the guideline, right? Um, so if you look for non-specific features of envenoming, um, chances are very high that uh, patients could develop severe envenoming, right? And finally, antivenom. Now, antivenoms are, um, you know, they are very old drugs. Like they were de initially developed more than 125 years ago, right? Um, so the production procedures have never changed. or oh, they are almost the same. So basically, they are animal origin antibodies. So we inject horses or um, camels, so goats and so on with snake venoms. And snake as the animal develops um, IgG uh, and then we uh, harvest IgG from the animal and remove the FC portion to develop Fab2 antivenoms, right? So they can be monovalent and polyvalent depending on whether you are immunizing the host with one type of venom or several types of um, venom, right? There are two important things, efficacy and effectiveness. Efficacy is whether the antivenoms have antibodies that can bind with the venom toxins in the ideal conditions. Effectiveness is whether the antivenom can lead to clinically detectable improvement, right? So these are two separate things. There can be an antivenom with good efficacy. That means they have good antibodies that bind with toxins in the ideal environment, but that will not lead to a clinical effectiveness, right? Most of the problems associated with our antivenoms are with effectiveness. They have good efficacy, but uh, they are not simply able to reverse the pathophysiology of envenom. Now, again, as I said, once the uh, you know bite happens, toxins go to circulation and some toxins reach the target sites. When you do antivenom, which is directly to the circulatory compartment, the, tox the antivenom can neutralize whatever the toxins in the circulation. However, they are not very good in migrating to target sites in peripheral uh, locations because these antivenom molecules are very large in size compared to toxin molecules, right? So they are very poorly reaching the target sites, right? So again, the, uh, with regards to the antivenom, the primary site of action is circulation, Clinical effectiveness is limited uh, by its pharmacokinetics as well as the unique pathophysiology as we seen in coagulopathy and neurotoxicity where we know that you know, by the time the antivenom is given, probably the irreversible damage has happened. So it's kind of a damage control, right? So um, giving antivenom as early as possible is the priority, right? So basically that is it. I think I have taken a bit more time, about 12 minutes. Um, sorry about that, uh, but still, uh, if there are any questions, I'm uh, free to answer. Uh, yes, sir. It's actually, I can't you can't ask you to stop. This is such an interesting topic, uh, and uh, we had more than 250 participants today, as well as there are a lot of patients. People are waiting. Uh, so now uh, there are multiple questions coming through chat as well as our Google Sheets. So I'll categorize the questions. So I keep the management question for our next sessions. And uh, first I'll start with this identification. Uh, after filtering the questions, I have two questions. First, how you differentiate uh, Cobra from the rat snake? All right. So if we uh, follow the same, um, you know, identification um, key, that is not a problem because rat snake neck you can't see a loose skin like you know um, like um, collapse hood you can't see something like that in rat snake i'll give you another tip for identifying rat snake it's a good question because 
rat snake juveniles or the babies are sometimes very confusing right they don't have a hood or something like that that confuses with uh, cobras but they are sometimes really uh, annoying because uh, you know uh, uh, they they can uh, they can have all sorts of color bands right so this is a rat snake uh, right this is a rat snake now if you see now can you see the enlarged image yes sir we can yeah so in this one this is a rat snake if if you can see now below the eye across the lips there are black color lines crossing the two lips can you see that clearly yes that is a very characteristic thing for uh, rat snake if you see a rat snake like just see whether it has a hood or not um if it is if, so it doesn't if it say um, if it is a cobra it should have a hood but even not worrying about hood just look at this lips right if there are black lines running across the lips that is characteristic for uh, rat snakes even the large ones they have this feature right and their eyes are quite big compared to cobras right eyes are quite big right so i'm trying to minimize this yeah okay right so that is one um i think that would be enough answer um, is it okay yeah uh, the second question came through the common one the co uh, the russell's viper and uh, small like that in baby python how do you differentiate all right so again uh, this color marking the three rows of elliptical markings running along the body so the, this is the, the mid dorsal one and then two sides of the body there are two rows again running right this is the side so you can see in the sides also there are two rows right so three rows of elliptical markings running across the body is characteristic but this is uh, baby um, uh, python you can see there are no no marks like that. These are blotches. Oval shaped marks versus blotches. Very, very easy. I thought um, it would be enough. Uh, any unclear things about that? I guess it's. Uh, in between Russell Swipe and the Python, is there any science at the head? To differentiate? Well, yes. So the head, Russell Swipe has this white color V mark on the margin of the head right and russell's viper head is actually very triangular uh, python one is not very triangular right but um, sometimes um, if you if the shape confuses but russell's viper head this fine v mark running across the running along the border of the head but here it is not usually these heads of pythons are very pale in color right and then if you really look closely, you can see this, you know, the head shields of the python is enlarged, but Russell Swiper head shields are very small. But I think uh, the body coloration is usually, um, you know, it's not confusing at all. It's um, the blotches versus uh, oval shaped um, elliptical or elliptical or oval shaped marks. Uh, the next question is, uh, they have any a lot of queries regarding uh, the half nose. Uh, the first question is all three are classified under, is that all three are classified under uh, medically important? That means uh, can they cause same uh, toxicity? Yes, yes. So the problem is um, most of the other two, uh, the bites by most of, most of the other two are not very well identified because hump nose wipers they you know the highland wiper or uh, um, lowland hump nose wiper you, that differentiation of the three so species, they have they, mentioned uh, two specific hypnale hypnale and hypnale sara yes so hypnale hypnale is the commonest and most widespread one and hypnale zara and nipa are restricted nipa is restricted in um, highlands um like elevations above Noorelia and quite common around like Haggala and uh, you know that high elevations. 
Sara is common around in wet zone, shaded home gardens as, and forests. But if you take most of the human habitation, especially in plantations, all dry zone, it is hypnali hypnali. So because of the large number of bites reported from hypnali hypnali, we know certain factions cause severe envenomies. But because of Sahara bites and Nipah bites are relatively rare, there are not many severe envenomies reported. But for sure, Sahara, there are deaths as well as uh, there are severe envenomies. Nipah, there are envenomies, severe envenomies, but no deaths reported. What my point is, that is not because potentially the two venoms are less potent. That is because the number of bites are less because the distribution range is narrow so that the reporting is, um, you know, uh, not uh, common, right? But if my, my point is, when we have studied their venoms in labs, uh, they have procoagulant activity. That means venom can um, cause clotting ab abnormalities and so on. So if you look at in the lab, it doesn't really show that, you know, um, the NEPA or ZARA are, you know, are unable to cause serious enemies. They are able, only thing is that the reported bites are low. Uh, sir, another question, because we are researching this field and a kind of expert, uh, is there any, uh, any antibody test or any specific test to diagnose snake innovation? Yes. So we have actually developed um, venom detection analyzers uh, for um, snake identification, but they were for research purposes, right? Uh, the problem is when we do the uh, test, um, we wait for certain number of samples for, uh, you know, to run the test. So real time for patient treatment, I don't think so. but. Uh, my friend Kalana Madhuge uh, in uh, Peradeniya, he, his ELISA, he is actually helping with hospitals, especially for post-mortem, uh, like sometimes like, for example, for forensic identification. Um, so if you are not sure about a snake bite, uh, whether a, 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 a death probably was due to a snake bite or so, you can send a blood sample to him and uh, it will take a couple of days. He will say, um, he's in the uh, Department of Biochemistry of um, University of Peradeniya, Faculty of Medicine. So uh, it will take a couple of days, but uh, post-mortem, uh, most likely you can identify um, the uh, or, or snake, but not real time because these ELISA tests take at least overnight incubation um, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, detecting uh, or the ELISA procedure to be completed. So that is that is the problem. So uh, when it comes to managing snakes, that may not be helpful because um, you can't get a quick result. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are multiple management questions came to our line because of time constraints. We have restricted those questions and we will be answering those questions in our next session. It is about the medical management of snake bites. There will be a session in upcoming month, uh, most probably. So I would like to thank uh, our resource person today, uh, Prof. Anjana Silva, uh, and his efforts, which makes which is such an interesting lecture. And uh, that's uh, how we have this much of participants. Uh, and this lecture will be available in a couple of days in our YouTube channel. You can go and subscribe. And Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. And uh, uh, Dr. Sachini will give you a concluding remarks. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity for um, uh, GMOS3 and uh, team, and uh, especially Dr. Himal uh, for inviting me. And it was quite a pleasure. And I'm very happy uh, if you need any help, especially with regards to identification, just um, you know, give me a call and uh, send me. Um, the pictures um, via um, WhatsApp or uh, Viber. I will, um, you know, at any time. I will. Uh, I'm most happy to help you all. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anjana. Also, thank you, uh, Dr. Himal, for introducing me. 
and uh, as uh, Dr. Himal said, uh, we would like to inform you that uh, the question, uh, questions on snake bite management uh, will be answered during the next session on uh, snake bite management, which will be held uh, during the second week of December. Uh, so we invite all of you to participate for that and also to uh, clarify your queries. The link for the applicant. Uh, for applying the e-certificate has been sent to the chat box. Please uh, fill the uh, fill the uh, link, and uh, irrespective of your marks for the questions, all of your all of applicants will be given the e-certificate. At any time, you can uh, recapitulate uh, what you have gained through this webinar uh, via the three YouTube channels. Uh, and finally, we thank all of the participants for the today's webinar. Thank you.